think that's on. Is that right? No? Okay, fabulous. <laughs> good. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be here again. It's good to be here again in God's house and with so many people here. So that's fabulous. So today, um, I'm preaching on wilderness part two. Now, let me get that piece of paper. A few weeks ago, Jess, I'm not sure if she's here today, um, she, she uh, uh, spoke wilderness part one, but she didn't know it was part one. Um, <laughs> excuse me. And, uh, and, and she, she spoke at length about our, the fact that we all uh, go through wilderness times. We all have times when we're not as close to God as we would like to be. And, you know, maybe we think that our prayers are kind of hitting the walls and bouncing off and we just can't sense God's presence. And, and Jess spoke to us quite powerfully how those can be times which result in benefits, if you like, because we can get closer to God through those times. But generally, when we, we go through a wilderness experience, it's fairly short-lived. It might not feel like it at the time, you know, for a few weeks, a few months or whatever. It might feel a long time when you're going through it. But in the big scheme of life, it's only a short time. However, sometimes we go through wildernesses which are longer than that. And I want to uh, look at one of those wildernesses, or the, the wilderness in the Bible, which seemed to go on for a lifetime, and indeed was a life, lifetime for some people. So, if you've been in church kind of any, even a short length of time, you will probably have uh, learned about the, the Israelites being trapped in Egypt as slaves. It was a, not a pleasant time for them. The, Israel, uh, the, the Egyptians were not kind to them at all. Uh, but God, God saw the, their plight and he said, I'm going to set them free. And so he sent a man called Moses to, to set them free. And they had that wonderful opportunity to see God work and God parted the Red Sea for these thousands of people to walk through on dry land and what was the other side of the, the Red Sea? The wilderness. You probably guessed it. <laughs> and so these, these people had been used to taking orders and been treated badly. And they weren't used to having a, a master, a God, who was kind. So although God had drawn them out of captivity, across, through the Red Sea... It was difficult for them to, to connect with a loving God who actually wanted the very best for them. They knew that at some point in the future, this chosen race of the Israelites would settle in the land of Canaan, the promised land, but there's a gap between Egypt and the promised land, and that was the wilderness. God provided for them food every day, apart from on Sunday. I won't, because they collected two, lot, two, two lots of food on Saturday. But I wasn't planning to go into that. But, but God, God provided for them. <laughs> and, uh, and God led them through the wilderness. He led them by a pillar of cloud during the day and fire at night. So if they were, you know, traveling 
at any time of day or night, God's presence was above them. And when the, the cloud lifted, they knew that they needed to pack up all their belongings and move on. So God guided them through the wilderness, through the desert, and he provided for their needs. Then at some point, and I've, I've been reading this up, and there's no, uh, no particular date in history that can be pinpointed, <laughs> they sent out spies into the land of Canaan, the promised land, they sent out one spy from each of the tribes of Israel to, to go through the land and to find out what it was like. And, uh, and they spent 40 days going round that land, uh, observing what the people were like and what the, uh, the fertility or not of the land was and, and, and all the rest of it. And they, they, the 12 of them came back. So, well, they came back with a huge bunch of grapes and pomegranates and figs and saying, look, you know, fabulous, fabulous land for, you know, for fertility. You know, th this is the fruit that we brought back. And they said that the people there were like giants, descendants of Anak. The people seemed like giants. But, and their cities were fortified as well, but, as Caleb said, God's given us this land so we can do this. Let's just get up, get, pack up and go because we have God's word on this. And Joshua agreed with him. But the other ten spies said, hang on, these people are like giants and we seem like grasshoppers. They, there's no way, there's no way we're going to conquer that land, even if God says, we don't think we can do this. And they poisoned everybody else's mind to, to believe that actually it wasn't possible. They put fear in people's hearts, such that if they, you know, they, they went across to try and take that land, that they would be killed themselves. So they, let, they gave fear an opportunity in their hearts And as a result, God was angry. And he said that none of that generation would find their way into Canaan because all would die apart from Joshua and Caleb because they were the only ones who believed God's promise. They were the only ones who weren't gripped with fear that fear which prevented them from moving forward. And then if we fast forward a bit to, I mean, I guess quite, quite a number of the people must have died in that time because uh, they, they were there for 40 years and they, they're probably thinking actually, you know, may, maybe at some point, um, you know, we will be moving into the land of Canaan which God has promised God had sent them round the long way round, so he'd gone round the mountain, but they'd, they were approaching Canaan again. Moses was at the end of his life, towards the end of his life, and two of the tribes came to him. And we've got some words of... Ah, fabulous. Right, well, I'll read it from there, because it's bigger. <laughs> So, they said, if we have found favour in your eyes, let this land be given to your servants as possession. Do not take us across the Jordan. Moses said to the Gadites and Reubenites, should your fellow Israelites go to war while you sit here? 
Why do you discourage the Israelites from crossing over into the land the Lord has given them? This is what your fathers did when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to look over the land, referring back to when the spies went in. So Moses wasn't very happy with that. It's like, actually, this is what happened before. We're not going to let you ruin things. I can sense a sadness, a real sadness, that they, they hadn't grasped in all that time that, that God was a good God and he got something brilliant planned for them in the promised land of Canaan. Anyway, they, they, went, they went away and they came back to Moses and they said this. We would like to build pens here for our livestock and cities for our women and children. But we will arm ourselves and go to battle and go ahead of the Israelites until we have brought them all into this place. So they were basically saying, yes, okay, you want us to fight because you know, we're, we're, we'll be letting the, the rest of the tribes down, but we still want to stay on the east side of the River Jordan because, look, you know, it's, it's, it's good for cattle, and we've got cattle. We've, you know, we've been blessed in the wilderness. You know, it may not have been God's best, but we've, we've been blessed... Um, and actually, you know, we're comfortable here now. They said, we're happy to settle for second best because actually we, we don't want to make the move. And half of the tribe of Manasseh agreed with them as well. So two and a half tribes were saying, actually, we're going to settle for second best. And that's so sad. That is so sad. And I wonder how we would have reacted at that time. Are we people who want to stay with what we know? Human nature is, is very much like that. You know, there's even the expression, better the devil we know than the devil we don't. But actually, they weren't, that wasn't it. It's was like be, they were saying, better the devil we know than the, than the God we don't. I mean, that's, that's my words, of course. That's <laughs> but they were prepared to settle for second best rather than push through and move their families to something better. And I, th I would suggest that often we do that. We think about the, the what ifs. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if we don't like it when we've got, gone over there? You know, maybe we'd, you know, we'd have been better off in, you know, in the other side. So they were scared of the giants, effectively. Those people who seemed like rugby players, <laughs> and they were not. <laughs> we have giants too, but most of them are, are between our ears. And I'm not saying you have a large brain necessarily, but just... <laughs> But yeah, so we, we have giants. Those fears which prevent us from moving forward. Those things which prevent us from even daring to do what we believe God is asking us to do. And I'm just wondering whether, whether you have any 
hopes or dreams which have been kind of left on the shelf because you couldn't face the challenge of doing something different. Maybe they are, they are kind of hopes and dreams which you know that God has given to you or things which you, you couldn't say for certain God has given to you, but yet it's been something, something in your mind. It would be wonderful to do that. But because of fear, you've been held back. When we are frightened of things, we, we self-protect. We can build walls or cages around ourselves to can feel like protection. I've experienced it myself and I've seen other people do it. You think that you're protecting yourself from from having to step out, but actually those bars or those walls hold you in. You give them permission to hold you in and lock you in to a certain way of living so that you don't have to face the unknown or the fear of the unknown. And I'm just thinking, actually, sometimes you might have lots of areas of your life where you, you are completely happy to not live in fear, but there may just be some one area, one or two areas, where you actually don't quite believe that stepping out would benefit you, because you can't quite believe that there's something better on the other side. So fear has such a big part to play. And sometimes we can dress it up with spiritual language and, and reasoning. But if we dig deep, if we dig deep, there are fears within us, within all of us. I don't think anybody's exempt. And that's because the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus has come that we might have life. Life in all its fullness. So we know the enemy's out there trying to steal us of all the, the hopes and the dreams and the good things God's got for us. And yet we still fall into his trap. But I want to say today that God is giving you another opportunity to step out from your prisons, to step out from your fears and embrace the good things he has for you. He's saying, I don't want you to settle for second best because I've got so much more for you. You know, we may have so many areas where uh, we, we feel trapped. It could be finances, it could be health, it could be relationship issues, and we just can't believe that anything could be better. But God's saying, dare to believe me. Dare to believe that I have better for you. And I think, too, that God is saying that as church, brothers and sisters in Christ, he is inviting us to go deeper with him, to that deeper place of intimacy where we can know him on such a tender level that we discover more of his love and his goodness and his good thoughts towards us. He's inviting us into that deeper place where we can know how faithful, how wonderful, how glorious he is and we can be, begin to be envisioned again 
for his best for us, inspiring us not to settle for second best. Because that's so sad when we settle for second best. And I'm preaching to myself too, so please don't think, think I'm not. And here with church and in the local area, we've settled for second best. And I think God is, is inviting us to rise up in his power as his army to shoulder to shoulder be on the same team to push back those powers of darkness which threaten to, to, to trap us and keep us trapped forever. Not, and to say not just within the church but actually beyond the church into the local area. We are all called by God for a purpose. And I think now is the time to seek God for that purpose because he has a part to pay for each one of us. Just as the Israelites couldn't capture the, the, the land of Canaan, their promised land, without the other two and a half tribes joining in, everyone was required. And here I believe God would say that each of us Whatever our gifts, whatever our talents, we have a part to play. We've been put in this church for a reason. We're not just here randomly. We're here because, because God has a purpose for us to be here. And he's calling us to work together as a team, to rise up and become his people in this place for this time. And he's saying, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, because he has good things for us. Do not let the giants prevent you from stepping in to the good things he has for us and for everybody. And sure, there might be some short-term pain. And I think of Jesus, who we celebrated today, who gave his life, gave his life, that we could all be saved. He so loved the world that he gave his life. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was saying, oh, God, please take this cup from me. Oh, I really don't want to do it. Yet, because the hope set before him, because he knew the legacy he would leave by stepping out into the fear and saying, actually, fear, you have no power over me. And we are called to do the same. To see our lives as not just insular and trying to survive for ourselves, but actually to see the bigger picture, because God has placed us in the bigger picture. To work for him and to impact the people we meet in the local area. And he's called us to rise up as church, church and be seen to be his people. And I want to just take another a look at uh, the jails that we put ourselves in. Please, Carla. Okay, I don't know if you can read the words. They might not be large enough, but I couldn't fit them in behind the bars otherwise. <laughs> so that is us, it, you know, in our jails. Now, we normally spell that word J-A-I-L, but there's another spelling, and maybe that's just because I'm old. <laughs> but uh, G-A-O-L. So that's an alternative spelling of that. And if I could have the next slide, please, Carla. So let us come out of our jails 
and engage with God's goals. Now, God's good at playing on words. If you, you, know, if you read the Bible, there are lots of those. And I think this, this, this came to me, and I think this is so, such a powerful thing. Because it's when we come out of our jails that we can move forward together towards the goals that God is putting us before, putting before us. Now I'm going to sing to you. Jesus, all for Jesus, all I am and have and ever hope to be. Jesus, all for Jesus, all I am and have and ever hope to be. For it's only in your will that I am free. For it's only in your will that I am free. Jesus, all for Jesus, all I am and have and ever hope to be. It seemed appropriate for me to sing to you because some of you may know I've had a real struggle with my voice in the last two or three years. My vocal cords didn't do what they were supposed to be doing and sometimes it was difficult to speak, let alone sing. And even now, I'm left with a voice which sometimes cracks. It's not reliable. And if you're sitting next to me in church, I apologise. No. But it felt right for me to face my fear and say, you have no power over me. When I surrender my fear to the authority of God, he can do amazing things. And it would be wrong of me for him to challenge you a lot, to, to step out from behind your fears without doing the same myself. So I invite you all to consider what are your fears? What do you need to put under submission to the will of God? It may be scary, but walking out in faith does not mean we don't have fear. We just mean, it just means that we, we, we put it under our feet. It's actually, this is, you're not going to have any power over me. I'm going to step out and do what God wants. And when we do that, we walk into the freedom which Jesus invites us to walk into, that abundant life. And so I invite you to consider what are your prisons? What are the bars or walls of your prison? which you've allowed to prevent you from stepping forward in faith. Maybe I could ask the, the band to come up now for the last song, and I, will, uh, and I will just say a prayer. Father God, we thank you that you love us so much that you don't want us to settle for second best. Thank you that you have a plan and a purpose for each of our lives. Whether we're old or whether we're young or whatever we feel has disqualified us, Lord, 
you still have a plan for us. So Lord, please open our eyes to know what you are saying, our ears to hear what you are saying to us and our eyes to see our brothers and sisters around that we may partner together and work for your kingdom in this place and the surrounding area. Amen.